My name is Tommy Pearson, and I'm the host this year of the World Soundtrack Awards. Such a huge pleasure to be back here in uh, in wonderful Ghent. Um, this is the this is day uh, this is part four of uh, the World Soundtrack Academy Industry Days. Uh, we're doing four days of talks and masterclasses uh, in film and music organized by Film Festival Ghent. And as I'm sure all of you know, Film Festival Ghent really is the place internationally, the home of film music and has been for so long in its dedication to the art of film composition. Um, it's supported by SABAM and uh, Culture and Creative Europe cultural program for the InMix Composers Lab. Um, tomorrow here, just a little heads up, uh, we have a piano uh, pa panel talk on Clara Sola and some composer talks with uh, wonderful composers, uh, Nenita Desai and Max Richter. Uh, Max is the uh, special guest of the World Soundtrack Awards on Saturday night. Um, and on Saturday at the opera, uh, we have a meet and greet with the composers and other guests, uh, including Daniel Pemberton. Uh, and uh, we also have Q&As with guests and World Soundtrack Award nominees. Uh, definitely something to uh, to look out for. Today, uh, we have a mix of masterclasses, panel talks, and uh, a composer talk. At 2.30, we have uh, the InMix Composers Lab panel talk. At 3.30, we have a masterclass with the writer, Stefan Eicher. And at 4.30, I shall be talking to composer Daniel Pemberton about his career. Uh, but first, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Leslie Jackson. She's a film composer manager um, from UK Film Music. And her international roster of composers includes composers like Natalie Holt, who I'm sure many of you will have seen this morning and who's uh, are going to be part of the World Soundtrack Awards, uh, Jacob Groth, um, Matlis Kibom and Adam Norden, amongst many others. Um, so put it this way, Leslie is perfectly placed to discuss how composers get into this industry and what they do when they get there. Um, I would say that attending this masterclass is a very good first step. Um, so please welcome Leslie Jackson. I'm going to spend most of the presentation behind this uh, pedestal or podium. Uh, the posh seats are reserved for the talent. I'm an agent, so I just get to stand in this little 10% of the room over in the corner over here. Um, my presentation, the masterclass today, is really engineered and designed to talk to people who are emerging composers, people who are on the cusp of finishing their studies and ready to take the step into film score music. I've got a device that will help me hopefully take me onto the next onto the next slide. So UK Film Music, I'm going to be giving you advice about entering the film. Um, music market, although I set up my company in March 2019, <laughs> which one, which with hindsight was a peculiar time to do it. So we had a good six months and then we were locked down for a year. Um, but business, business is good. Um, we look after composers in the UK, in the Nordics, in Western Europe. I have a composer in America and also in Australia. Um, the impact of Brexit is not yet quite known about how people, you know, transfer from market to market. Um, and in addition to composers, I represent music editors and music supervisors. So essentially, as far as film and TV productions are concerned, that is the music department. I think a good way to know about whether you're ready to enter the film music market is to ascertain how much about the film music market you already know. So we're going to start off with a very short quiz. You don't have to answer if you don't know, but you really should know. I'm not sure which markets you're all from. Is it apart from obviously Belgium? Do we have people here from France? Yeah, Germany, England, a few. So where's everybody else come from? Italy, okay, okay. I, I, I actually don't speak any language apart from apart from English. So, uh, the first question is: How many films were either produced or co-produced in your nation last year? Um, I don't expect you all to shout out the answer, but that is, to all intents and purposes, the beginning of your opportunity. You must know how many films are made in your country to be able to know if, what chance you stand to be able to work on some of them. Could you name one of your country's biggest film 
production companies and one of your country's biggest TV production companies? And do you know who runs those companies? Have you put your name in front of those companies or to any of the people who work at those companies? Because you should also be familiar with all of that side of the business. This is, uh, you can shout out the answer to this. Everybody will know this. Who scored the latest James Bond film, No Time to Die? Come on, we need to get some interaction going. Okay, we know there was hands, but who was credited with all the additional music? Does anybody know that? No? Okay. That's a very well-known composer called Steve Mazzaro. Look him up. Look what he's been doing. But additional music is a first step into film scoring. Um, and additional music is where you might want to start set your sights at the, at the beginning of your film music career. Which film won the 2021 Oscar for the best music score? Sorry? No, that was the year before. It was Soul, and the composers of Soul were, and yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, moving into TV, Squid Game has recently taken over from Bridgerton as Netflix's most watched original TV series. Do we know who the composers were for both? You know everything. <laughs> Excellent, top of the class. Uh, and they're changing tax slightly. How much is an annual subscription to IMDb Pro? You should all be using IMDb Pro. <laughs> $19.95 a month. Excellent. Um, how many minutes of orchestral score would you typically expect to achieve per hour at a recording studio when you're creating a film score? Yeah. It depends on how much money you have. It depends on how many people are in the orchestra. But, but typically, for an hour of um, recording time, you could expect to achieve about eight minutes of music, which is why film scores are so hugely expensive, when you probably wouldn't see much change from £70,000 a day for an orchestra at Abbey Road. What are the top five international film festivals? not in order. You should all know that they are Cannes, Berlin, Venice, Toronto, and Sundance. Ron's Gone Wrong is one of the latest releases from Disney, and it's produced or co-produced by a UK production company. Does anybody know the name of that company? Who was our person from London? It's, uh, they're called Locksmith Animations. Um, and Ron's, the, the, um, the little boy, Barney, who's Ron's owner, does anybody know who his voice is? Who places, who does his voice? Nope. Okay, question 10. It's the last one, you'll be very pleased to know. What are, the, what are stages four and nine in this typical example of a feature film production process? One, the film is optioned. Two, it goes into pitch. Three, it receives a treatment. Four, what is, what is four? Five, it goes into pre-production. Six, it goes into production. Seven, into post-production. Eight, it becomes completed. And nine, it is... Nine is, nine is it's released after it's completed. Number four, the stages between treatment and pre-production. Script, yeah. The, the um, development kind of covers the option and the pitch and the treatment, and then pre-production is after script, and that kind of covers your attachments and what have you. So that's the end of the quiz. I don't know how you all felt, that how well you thought you did, but you should know this cut. You should know about the industry that you want to embark on. COVID-19 was a big part of last year, and I don't want to talk too much about it, except that it's crazy to ignore it. So what is the impact of COVID-19 and has it affected our industry? Well, I'm based in the UK. That's my main business, so I'm mostly familiar with that. And we can see that from um, 2019, where we had a 10.3 um, billion box office income in 2020, that reduced to one. Um, 
And in fact, I think we'll come quickly on to another slide that shows that. You can see from 2011, in that 10-year period, the nice steady growth of um, box office at the theatre, the income, and you can see the huge impact, not just of the, how the UK has fared, but of the market as a whole. So from 41 billion to 11 billion. Um, so it's a market that has really, really suffered. And it's the market that you're about to enter, but we need now to look ahead. And looking ahead, it's actually lots of good things to look forward to. There's more film production companies um, in the UK, Europe, US, and Asia. There is way more co-productions and greater funding. And when I launched UK Film Music in 2019, that growth of co-productions was one of the reasons why I um, worked with international composers because there's often a demand even in UK projects to seek, for co to seek composers from other nations. There's more TV platforms than ever. Um, and of course, we know Netflix, we know Amazon, we know Apple, but at the moment there's, a, there's 200 and it's growing. And there are 1.5 billion subscribers. And subscribers is one user. So if you start to think about how many people view per subscription, that 1.5 billion, is, is billion may be nearly twice that size. Because of that, there is enormous competition to attract new audiences and to retain audiences. The average household is probably spending £400 a year plus on subscriptions to their um, film and TV enjoyment. Um, and it's important that they don't drift from any of those platforms. We're all enjoying better, high-spec viewing devices um, and TV uh, or the home cinema is growing exponentially. So again, that's a reason why people are investing so much money. And there's this huge increase in both quantity and quality of film and TV production. And TV is now very much not seen as a kind of the poor relation to film. It was before people thought, you know, move from film and then into TV. But as we've heard this morning with talking um, to Natalie, programs like, or TV series like Loki, what Apple are producing, there's no way that that's a, a, second, a second tier of, of production. In terms of who is, uh, which are the most um, watched platforms, that's not in an order, but you can see the number of people the, and the number of paying, paying subscribers to each. Um, Apple have the biggest, although they're very, um, they're not really sharing with their information. So 700 million Apple users, but that is across all their disciplines of TV, music and games. But that together, um, I think, please don't add it up, but I think it comes to about one and a half billion. Oh, I'm pressing the button. I've got a device. So looking ahead, um, the BFC is the British Film Commission, um, international um, film and high-end TV production in the UK topped 2.34 billion in 2020. So although the market at the cinema really declined, the investment in new shows in 2020 was really good. So we've the, the knock-on effect, we, we've kind of come out the other side and we're starting to see now how that growth is going to impact. Uh, studios in UK, those are a couple that you will all probably be familiar with for, just from a name point of view. Those are existing studios. There's a new £700 million complex in Hertfordshire being built. Sky is building a new studio complex. And apart from in the UK, we know that the Iceland who, uh, or Iceland who was heralded this probably this time last year was heralded as the new kind of Hollywood. The Nordics, Western Europe, New Zealand, Australia, they've all... Um, making major investment and plans to build TV studios that will rival Hollywood. So film is without a doubt uh, here and it's here to, to stay. Uh, it's here to grow. And where there is film, there is music. Um, there's always been film and music before. Apart, well, as soon as there was, as soon as there was uh, the visual, there was the music going through from the silent era, golden age, hybrid age. I don't need to read them all out, but that's the kind of the natural or the chronological um, progression to, interestingly, the no boundaries. I don't think you could say, again, 
referencing back to what Natalie was saying this morning when she was talking about the different voices and the different strands and all the things that have been introduced to the Loki theme, then you can see that uh, where we are now is anything and everything. Now here's a warning. There are many more composers than there are film scoring opportunities. There's also many more composers than there are agents to look after them and go out and find them the work. So to a certain extent, as an emerging composer, a lot of the onus to find your work as you enter this industry falls on your own shoulders. Um, the competition is harder. A-list composers, the people who are scoring the big box office features and all ever present in the film world are now working to deliver music in that very high-end TV series and franchises, not just from um, a musical perspective, but that's also seen with castings, um, with Kate Winslet, for example, doing the um, Mayor of Easttown. Uh, TV is a very, very attractive option for everybody. You will there uh, for most likely need to support yourself um, and rely on other sources of income before you're able to make it financially and successfully by yourself. And you need to develop a thick skin. Um, and you can't try once and it didn't work and that's the end of it. it you need, you have to get used to rejection personally, frequently, sometimes kindly, sometimes not very kindly. Um, and directors often, however much you may find a director at the early stage of your career who asks you to do things for free now and then as soon as he's made it, he'll give you the first option on his great big movie. When directors get big opportunities, big opportunities comes with big finance and big finance come with executive producers and they, with the greatest respect, have the last say in who's going to be doing what. So ultimately... Um, you need to look after, not look after yourself, but you need to be prepared that this is, you know, a big part of what, of what lies ahead. But you can celebrate. You are embarking on one of the most creatively fulfilling industries that there is. I've seen that. I, at uh, UK Film Music, we have an emerging roster um, as well as we do an international roster and an award-winning roster. And when you um, follow the paths of people, um, it's extraordinary and very exciting to see them start to make the money, um, whether it's as an additional composer, um, whether it's um, doing short films. I do try to say to people, you shouldn't work for free. I don't believe that people should work for free. Um but sometimes, if it's a director that you believe in, if it's a story that you really believe in, if it's touching on a subject that's very topical and very relevant and you want to make a contribution, then you must still have a contract and you must try and protect your music so that it doesn't get used elsewhere. But on occasion, there is a valid reason for maybe working um, for no money. Um, but you have committed to embark on this exciting and creatively fulfilling career. Or you're also earning, one of the nice things about working in the music industry is that what you do now and earn money now will pay you back well into your retirement as long as you make sure you don't sign everything over and not get a good deal. There's never been so many platforms or so much great content and the world has never been smaller. And by that, I mean COVID um, definitely eliminated, you know, the long lunches and the coffees and the face-to-faces and... If you can just put me in front of a director, I know I can convince him that I'm the person for his music. Um, in 2020, none of that was an option. And actually, a lot of work got done behind the scenes in 2020 without it. And as we go into the um, to this m more benefit, more fruitful kind of period, one thing that is um, has has stayed is this remote meeting, remote interviews, remote pitching, and often, not often, but occasionally delivering an entire job without actually meeting face-to-face -face with the people who are producing the project. Uh, so your communication has never been easier. Be creative, focused, positive, and always strive to deliver your best work. But I say your best work to brief. 
um, and we'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, be heard. It's never been easier to share your music than it's never been easier to share your music for free. There are so many platforms for you to put your music out onto, um, and you should be you should be present on all of those. Um, the composer job spec. I'm if I don't have a glass of water soon, I think I might fall over. <laughs> So before I go on, does anybody have any questions or would anybody like to make any contribution to anything that I've said so far in agreement or in in disagreement? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anybody from Netflix here? <laughs> Before I answer the question, we'll use net. We'll use Netflix. We'll use Netflix as an example. Where four or five years ago, Netflix was like the holy grail, and everybody thought that if they can get something on Netflix, it's their it's their ticket to kind of anything. Um, contracts with Netflix have changed a lot. They're now very short, uh, four sided, A four. Um, that is a really, really tough contract for a composer to to swallow. And essentially, I don't know if they will ever get around to it, but when you deliver music for a Netflix series, uh, there's two elements to it. If you're working on a Netflix TV show, they will contract you per episode and they will pay you when they send you episode one. And the, or they will send you as soon as they will pay you as soon as you receive an episode, half of that episode fee. They'll pay you the other half of that episode fee when that episode has been approved by Netflix. That's the contract that you sign. And if at any point they therefore don't like what you've done, there's no negotiating out of that contract. If you haven't delivered anything, to their satisfaction, you don't get paid 50%. And if there's any episodes that aren't delivered to their satisfaction, you don't even get the first fifth, the first half of that of that episode. Um, so it's tough. Um, and the other aspect of the Netflix contract is that they will keep your music. They own your music. They um, retain the right to edit your music. They edit, they retain the right to use your music in part or edited in any spin-off series or in any other series of their choosing that's broadcast on Netflix. <laughs> so you can decide if you want the contract or not. And for many people, you know, the, the you have to be principled. It's a it's a tough deal, but you're on the ladder, and a Netflix credit is a great credit. Credits are your currency for success in this industry. And when you're pitching for projects or if you have an agent who's pitching you, the first place people will go to look and see what you've done is they'll go into IMDb Pro or they'll visit your website or something where those credits will be. Um, and if you can be very principled, but if you don't actually have credited um, evidential experience of those credits, it's going to be even harder to get a job. At some point... Netflix will own so much music, they might actually never need to employ a composer. But they would have so much music by that time, it would cost them more, I believe, in the technical army that would be required to turn that music, to catalogue that music, and to turn it into something that is film score, film score worthy. Netflix were a trailblazer, and so whether um, that's how everyone's going to follow I don't know. I don't think so because there's too much. Uh, it's not so much noise about it in the UK, but certainly in the Nordics and in Europe, I think there where there are more film composer unions. They're trying hard to fight to change those kind of contracts, which I think is you know good a good and enviable task. Yeah, so it's a tough deal. But if somebody phoned me up tomorrow from Netflix and said, "Hey, have you got a composer?" I would say, yeah, what are you looking for? And I'd, you know, and then I'd worry about the contract and always be trying to get the best contract that I can um, when the con when the composer has been um, attached. Is that is that an answer? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. I wish, I wish we had unions here in person in the US. 
Uh, we don't, I don't think we've got, we haven't got a film school compo- composer union. We've got plenty of organisations that, that, uh, that champion causes, but nothing that's got any kind of, you know, negotiating sort of, um, clout. Um, but going back onto that composer job specification, your, which sounds, it's not meant to be patronising. I know you all know what a film score composer does, but again, it was touched on a bit this morning. Your job is to work with the director and the filmmaking team to contribute to the creative vision of the director. By the time a, by the time a film is ready to be made, it's likely that the, that the writer, who is often the director, this could have been his baby for five or six years. He will have, she will have in his or her mind, a vision for the, for the whole package. Uh, and music is a part of that. Um, recognize that the score and the music is one element of that. He's not going to compromise on that, on, on his or her vision. And so winning a job is not therefore a vehicle for a composer to say, right, now I'm going to show them what I'm made of. They think they want that. I'm going to give the music that's going to blow their minds and turn this film, I'm going to elevate it into something way better than they dreamt of because you'll be sacked. Um, That's not your job. Your job is to deliver within the brief great music, exciting music, award-winning music, but nonetheless, it must be music to brief. It must be music that's delivered within budget and without a fuss and to work as an integral part of the creative and also the technical production team. Does that make sense? Yeah? Good. Anybody asleep? Wake up? Right. Know your industry. Um, Know your nation's big film production companies and be familiar with their historic and the current and their future output. And it is true to say that there are, certainly in the UK, where it's a very big and it's a very buoyant and a very exciting film and TV market, there are documentary film production production companies, there are companies that focus on period drama, there are companies that focus on horror. So we kind of know... Um, which companies look after which product, which, which kind of, you know, which sort of genre. Um, and go to the cinema. You can't know your industry if you don't go to cinema. And when I say go to the cinema, I mean, like, watch lots of film. Could be a home cinema. Um, but go to the cinema uh, and, and and absorb, absorb the music and absorb, you know, the visual trends. Um, those are the top 10 um, TV um, streaming platforms. Or rather, they're not the top 10. They're the ones that are the best, but they're best for different reasons. So best overall, best value, best original content. Um, And all of those platforms have subsidiary channels as well. Like I said earlier, there's over 200 streaming platforms at the moment. Um, And they, again, like production companies, they all kind of have um, leanings towards a particular type of genre. So watch more TV and follow those trends. Identify, and I've said film music trends, but it's actually trends in general. Um, Squid Game is something that's in a kind of a trend sort of on its own. It'll be interesting to see how that kind of develops. Um, Get familiar with your production companies and post-production houses. You should be subscribing to film magazines, to TV guides. You should be going to film festivals, which obviously you do. Um, you should be entering film scoring competitions. Um, the Berlin International Film Scoring Competition opened its entries for 2022 last week. And I think that's 60 euros to, to enter. And they enter on the basis, they have two competitions there. It's a, it's a film scoring competition and also it's a sound design competition. It's not a huge prize. I think it's about 5,000 euros plus a whole load of um, technical sort of support and seminars and things. But what you do have is you then have an example of you scoring to picture, um, which is something that as an emerging composer is very, very difficult um, tool to acquire. Um, 
I get inundated, no, I don't get inundated, but I get plenty of approaches from composers who are looking for representation. And when I ask to see or I ask for examples of the work, I get sent links to SoundCloud or Spotify or great music platforms, but they are no indication to me at all of people's ability to score to picture because compose, film film composing is not composing. Um, and trying and it's a catch-22. How can you demonstrate your ability to score to picture if you've never had picture to score? So film scoring competitions, win or lose, you still get access to clips for scoring. You could score the same genre of movie or the same clip assuming once it's a comedy, once it's a horror, um, and give yourself lots of scoring to picture, scoring to picture practice. It's scoring to picture is not about um, rambling scenes of wonderful countryside and putting nice music on the background. Scoring to picture is recognizing change of mood, change of tone, whether you're leading the story, supporting the story, where there's dialogue, where there's other sound. It's not just about having cinematic music and thinking you can go and score a picture. Um, so enter film scoring competitions, follow the film news, and it, it doesn't have to be expensive. You can, you can follow all, you can follow all these companies and, um, information providers on Twitter, on Facebook, on any sort of platform um, and follow them all on your social media. Be active on your social media, even if it means just kind of retweeting with some kind of, you know, little symbol of um, agreement or disagreement. But if you want to be noticed in your industry, you have to be kind of as present as you can. Speak the film language. Um, music is like a whole language all of, it, of its own and it's a language that I don't speak at all and it's also the language that most film directors and producers don't speak some do um, but those who don't can find the language of music quite overwhelming um, and they, it's not that it will make them feel uninformed but it creates a barrier to communication for a director to be able to tell you what he wants from a film if he thinks that you only understand music in the terms in the official music terms so you need to learn the language of the film directors um directors are passionate about cinematography they're passionate about location special effects the casting and the music and sadly all too often it's in that order and producers, again, it's not always, but often uh, uh, produce are uh, um, interested in sticking to the budget. That's 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 what they're there for. And although they're recognising the importance of music, um, like I say, they don't really speak that language. So when people say they want a classical score, they don't want. Well, I'm not saying they don't. Sometimes they might, but often when people refer to a classical score, what they mean is they want an orchestral score. And it's a something as something as you know as basic as that. An orchestral score can be very contemporary, can be very edgy. So you need to understand what they mean um, when they when you know when when they start to talk to you about what they want from from music for their film. Again, and this is this is quite bleak. Usually, I talk to Scandinavians, and they are a much gloomier nation, so they like the gloomy kind of speak. Um, but often, sometimes a score is regarded as a post-production service. I am very familiar with films that don't even start to look for a composer until they've gone into post-production. Um, directors and producers want to just stay focused on the job in hand and they don't want to start those conversations. So bringing a composer on board, on set, to absorb the kind of the tone and the feel of the film is not necessarily something that's always regarded as important. But if you are brought in as a post-production stage, then the people that you're communicating with are less likely to be the producer and the director. They're most likely to be the post-production team. So you music editors um, and producer. And so you need to get very familiar as well, not just with the film language, but language, but with that kind of post-production technical language. Um, watch director Q&As at film festivals or online. Don't confuse and don't guess. 
and example music references are a great form of translation. So if you're finding, or if I'm finding when I'm trying to get a brief or some creative steer from a producer or a director about what's required, asking them to reference another film, score, or some music, or if it's a band or whatever, is often a good way of actually cutting through the, the terminology, but just being able to hear what it is that they want. So don't ever be asked, don't be frightened to ask for sort of a musical reference. Ah, oh, networking. In my experience, composers are never happier than when they've locked their studio and they're sitting by themselves uh, just writing music. They're naturally self-isolating, been quite handy for COVID. Um, and the prospect of networking is for many a complete and total nightmare. I take you, you, everybody who's here, I don't necessarily put into that category because you are in fact here. Um, but networking and networking, networking events aren't necessarily about name badges, awkward introductions, and how am I going to get through this? And then, you know, that you can spend easily find some time um, just standing in a corner or sitting there having a, having a drink by yourself. Um, speed, speed pitching. Uh, I actually do quite a lot of speed pitching and I've met some really great composers, some of whom I've subsequently gone on to sign. Um, but it's not great for everybody. But what is easy, and I found it here, even with um, with a small group of people, that if you find a film festival and you go with a friend, whether they're connected to the industry or not, networking is much easier. You become more relaxed. You become more approachable if you have a friend, somebody just to go and hang out with. Um, and you'll be surprised um, if you can make your way into a bar in a city such as Ghent in the middle of a film festival, you're likely to find people in your industry in any pub or in any restaurant. And it's amazing how easy it is to just tap into somebody else's um, conversations. Take calling cards wherever you go. I don't know how many people have calling cards, but if you do have one, you can leave it on the table before you before you leave because as an agent, I'm a good contact for you. Um, I have put some cards out, which hopefully you're all able to pick one up on your on your way in. You must never leave um, any kind of opportunity environment without leaving some sort of contact information with somebody. Um, interestingly, when I put my little flyer together to come here, I decided to put um, a what are they called QR code on it. Um, and I couldn't believe how easy it was. I just went on to a company called QR Monkey, typed in my website, they gave me a car, they gave me a PNG, I downloaded it and printed it, and it's all completely free. And I thought, actually, if I was if I was a composer and I was going to a film festival and I had a website with my music on it, I'd have that I'd have that QR code on the back of my jacket. Need a composer. It's People who don't want it uh, aren't going to look at it. It's a bit quirky. Not everybody does it. But you've got to look for all the tools that you can for people to, to find you. Um, and when you do go to um, film festivals or networking events, networking events, I say go armed with something topical or relevant to talk about. That could just be the latest film. Um, the latest stats with regards to how COVID has impacted on the industry, latest viewing figures, new TV shows, somebody's, you know, won a competition. Just go and start a conversation because it's a lot easier to start a conversation than, than get included into a conversation that you don't know anything about. <laughs> so if you start it, then that's a lot easier to carry on. So networking is essential. Any questions? Okay. Identify your sound. Your sound is unique. Every composer I've ever met tells me that. Um, and it might well be true, but unique isn't a descriptor of your music. Um, so you have to find other ways to describe your music. And if it's hard to define it, 
And let's not forget, all your family and friends will tell you it's fantastic, it's marvellous, the best thing they've ever heard, it's really cinematic, and you're going to be the next John Williams. But that isn't actually going to help you in any way to get a job. You need to ask somebody who's in your industry to give you descriptors of your music. And even if it's different to the music that they... Uh, of, of, well, it will be different to their music, but even if it's not to their particular um, taste, they will still find musical words or terminology that help directors understand what it is that you do. So the right descriptors, whatever they are, will suit your music. A selection of three or four will suit your music and they'll be specific to your music. And then regardless of what you score throughout your career, uh, regardless of what genre it is, you'll likely find that those three words are present in every score that you deliver. Um, it doesn't preclude you from scoring to any style. Sometimes people will, you know, come with a music brief that says, I want a score that sounds like Hans Zimmer, but I haven't but I've only got 10,000 euros. Um, and it's possible. You know, most of you composers that I know, although you have a very... Um, distinctive signature sound you can do something to sound pretty much like anybody that you wanted to um your library your library is not all your music that's in files on your desktop or on your software your library must be categorized by playlists by genre by project type and each queue you might find will be in multiple folders. But at some point, once you've started networking and started meeting people and someone says, oh, actually, I have got a film. Can you send me some music for this or that? You need to be able to access your music quite easily and you need to have your music labelled quite easily. Um, you need to be able to access it easily as well when you're on the go. Where do you keep your music? Um, there's loads of platforms for playlists. Uh, Spotify, SoundCloud, Deezer, YouTube Music, iTunes, now Apple Music. And they're great for storage and cataloging, but they don't come with videos. When you are an established composer, you don't need necessarily to send examples of your music to picture because your credits and your experience speak for themselves. People understand or recognize that you know your craft. Um, but until such times, you need a music playlist and you need a video playlist. Um, Video showreels can be, um, well, they are generally out of date as soon as you've scored another project. Also, I do find that directors and producers, they'll turn on a showreel and if after play they're watching a clip of something that is so far removed from the project that they've got forthcoming, they're not going to spend time fast forwarding, stopping, rewinding and, and having another listen. So your weeks and months of putting a showreel together are best, that time is best spent creating a Vimeo or YouTube channel, somewhere where you can flip around the order, you can categorize by genre. And when you send links to that to directors and producers, they can easily see and work out how to navigate so that they get the most relevant, most relevant examples. Um, again, not an easy thing to do, especially if you're a self-isolator, but create an introductory video, just a very, very short video of you to the camera. Nobody's interested particularly in, you know, sitting on your grandma's lap when you were two and hitting your first piano note, but this is me, this is who I am, this is my last project and I'd love to work with you. Because in the age where we're not getting those opportunities to be in a room or in the elevator with somebody to sell ourselves, you are kind of faceless. So just a very short into your phone video selfie is a great thing to have on that on that uh, YouTube channel. Um, and link to your video channels from your socials and from your website. You pitch for jobs with your relevant music via disco and your relevant videos via Real Crafter. Those are the two um, platforms that I recommend. I don't recommend Real Crafter for music simply because they doesn't support meta tags. If people download music from Real Crafter into another file or to another format, if they play it on iTunes, all the data's lost. So Disco is the best for your music and um, Real Crafter is the best for video. And you get opportunities to put a little bit of an introduction to each one and a, and a biography on, on each format. So those are your best 
they, they're not even necessarily pitching tools because pitching suggests that there's a job, but they're a good way of just getting yourself onto people's radar. As is your biography, people will want to know a little bit more about you, but you paint the picture of who you are now. A biography should start off with the thing that you've done most recently. And if people are really intrigued by that and want to find out more and more and more about you, the more they read, the more they'll know. But the relevant stuff starts at the beginning. So sometimes it's just a quick question of looking at your biography and deciding, in fact, you've got everything right, you just got in the wrong order. There's no point in having at the bottom, oh, and last year I scored this great film for so-and-so, that's at the top. So if you need to flip it, flip it. Um, I think that's pretty much covered that. A short intro, list of credits, your ambitions, the composers and projects who've inspired you, and, and, and images, not baby photos, but biography. your biography doesn't need to be more than one side of A4. So once you've got your social media, once you've got your website, when you have your video showreel, when you have your music catalogued, easily accessible and in a position to produce um, relevant playlists, you're armed to go back out, you're armed to go out and try and um, let people become familiar with, with you, with your look, with your name. On, your, on all your socials and on your website, find an image that is an image of you that you like and keep that the one across all plat keep that the one that's across all platforms because no one's going to remember you from an image that they see once on one platform. But if they see it popping up again and again and again or three or four times, you will become uh, familiar to people a lot quicker. Contacts. I think I should be include or I... My email address came up at the beginning of this presentation. I hope that everybody would add me to their contact list. Um, you should be adding to that list and email addresses of everybody that you know in the industry, composers, film directors, the people from your college, your tutors, everybody that you, that you meet. Um, don't under, the, in, there's often valuable information on IMDb. There's loads of other resources that you can subscribe to. Um, and I think if you build a database on a proper program, it does ask you if the reason that you, the means by which you've got people's contact details, because we do have to be mindful of data protection and new GDPR rules. But if people's email addresses are publicly available on a site that you subscribe to, you do not need to ask their permission to then use that email address. Um, so you should be looking to build up that list of directors, as well as the people who are in post-production. When emailing to people, keep your communications relevant. Include a link to your website. Uh, don't attach music files to emails. And try always to strike a balance between not missing an opportunity and becoming a pest. Because once people have blocked you, you are. it is illegal if someone has asked you either through a contact program or by email to please stop contacting me, you really do have to stop contacting them. That is what the GDPR rules are there all about. And keep your communication short. One thing to add to this is that if you, the reason I say don't send music files to people is one, you don't know the device that people are going to be opening your communication on and you could really mess it up for them, in which case they'll blame you and they'll never like you. Also, Sending music without any kind of a brief is very, very dangerous because you might read a script or read something about a project in um, online or in a or in a um, an, in press that you really like the idea of, and in your mind you think you know how that wants to be scored, but that really could be a million miles away from the filmmaker's uh, vision. And if you send music that's wrong. They're not going to come back and say, oh, yeah, we really liked your email. Can you do something else? You're wrong. And they will not give you that, that, second, that second chance. So that's a good reason not for um, attaching music to your um, initial communications. Select productions for which realistically stand a chance of being offered. Um, and we all know what we mean by that, you know, Again, if you were listening to Natalie this morning and she explained very clearly the, her, her pathway 
um, was stalled because she was um, told that it wasn't any place kind of, you know, it was going to be too hard for women. Um, and then worked as an assistant. Um, you can't have a qualification or finish at a conservatoire and expect that you will land a Netflix project, even if it's a shitty contract. You're not going to land those jobs. There are anecdotal stories I know of somebody who just left school and they bumped into somebody on the bus and they happened to be scoring a project, but it doesn't like that. Um, so be realistic about what you about about where you pitch yourself, to whom you pitch yourself. Your credits are your currency. And the catch-22, it, it is the hardest thing. You need credits to show you that you can do it. Um, and if you don't get a chance to do it, how do you have a credit? It's it's just called perseverance. Um, and it doesn't matter how great you are. Ultimately, even if a director loves what you've done and really wants to work with you, he has to get that cleared by executive producers. And if they say, well, who's that? What have they done before? And you nothing, but I love the sound. It's not gonna get um it's not gonna get sanctioned by the people with the purse strings, essentially. Um, so be realistic. Don't send music until you have a creative brief or a steer. Send them a link to your music and video reels, but ex and and express what aspects of their project particularly appeals. Like it could be that you've just found out there's a film coming up and it's about people that you feel that you've got a lifelong um knowledge of uh you, you know, th there could be lots there could be lots of reasons why but don't try and anticipate the music and just c kind of try and integrate yourself into the team mentality of that production it'll be a given that you can do film score so get yourself into the team and then talk about their ideas for the music it's not about your ideas for the music tell me what ideas you've got and then you've got something that you can take home and explore and and further develop um and this is a summary really these are your must these really really are your must do's you must know your industry and its language you must network identify your um and your your own sound and market your sound, have your library in good condition um, and easily accessible, have a separate video library to music library, be easy to find um, with your website, your social media, and all your music platforms and let there be uniformity across all of those. Build your database because everybody on that database is a future, as a, a potential collaborator for your future. Communicate and be proactive, be determined, um, be relevant and, and be timely. And when that job does come, when you do land the pitch, then you need to deliver to the brief on time without any fuss and within the budget. Oh, so now you're all ready. If anybody's still awake. Are we awake out there? Was it useful? <laughs> Any, Any questions? questions? Thank you. Any questions from anybody? Any eye openers? Yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is a bit about oh. the... Uh, uh, sorry? <laughs> I have a, bit, a question a bit about the catch twenty two you were talking about before. Uh, it's like when we are students, we also sometimes work a lot on uh, pre existing films, and sometimes uh, it's fine to use them to show what you're capable of, but sometimes it's really not fine, especially if it's like big production films you you worked on. So, do you have like some kind of suggestion? Um, I think. The one thing that you always have to do is if you're rescoring anything as an I as a if, if if you're rescoring with a view to demonstrating your own signature sound, you have to make it very clear that it is a it is a, it is a rescore for those purposes, and you have to make sure that you would credit the composer of that project um, of the of the original project. 
Um, I would also say there'd be no harm in if there's a if there is a specific scene from a specific project, I would write to the production company or somebody who's involved to say this is your intention and would they have any objection? And they will most likely say no. Um, but give you sort of a sentence or something that you have to use underneath a bit like crediting a, um, a photographer for something. So I wouldn't strip music out of a scene and just put your own in and put it online. Um, I think you can do that in, you know, in your own studio. But if you put anything out there, you have to make it very, very obvious to anybody who might come across that, that, that's, that it's not your credit. Does that answer that question? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's just like sometimes uh, it can even if you even if you credit everything, uh, people are still like like for like big movie usually not okay to to let you uh, broadcast it broadcast it on platform. So sometimes you just have to. I personally just put the mu music without the pictures, but it's a bit sad. Well, broadcasting is very different area um i definitely wouldn't suggest that you broadcast it if you're using it for your own personal promotional reasons and you're sending it to an audience of one or two that's not broadcasting it i definitely wouldn't be putting it on your social media or putting it out there no i think that would be very dangerous there was a question from this chap here Oh, here we go. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wanting to ask you, thank you, first of all, for everything. Um, as an agent, what exactly is, um, what exactly do you look for when you discover a new talent? Because you've talked about the presence on social media, about the identity, about awards, about prizes, about musical identity and all of that. What is the first thing you look for when you discover new new composers, new talents, new new people? Well, that's a very good question. For me at the moment, I try to work with composers that don't really have any significant overlap with the composers that are already on my roster. I try to build my emerging roster with composers that I think are an are are a nice support mechanism for composers who are on my main roster because it's always the case that people want the best composer that you have but they haven't got the budget but if you can pitch a composer um creatively in the knowledge that that composer okay maybe you've asked for compose for composer a and it's a great project but to be honest with you for that budget or with the schedule it's not going to be possible to deliver but here is a person that i think has a similar kind of signature or is a developing signature or works with the same palette or who has worked with that composer before um and i do try to get my composers to sort of know each other um and 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 or use each other help help each other out um when composers ask when the composers approach me and send me music it's it's a it's a quick it's a quick process of elimination because if as soon as i ask for examples of um music to picture if they don't come forth i've got nothing to look at um and i can't this, it's impossible to consider a composer who hasn't sent me examples of music to picture because i've got nothing I've got nothing, uh, nothing, to go, nothing to go on. But when you do see examples of young composers, I, I don't know, it's what stirs anybody. Sometimes you just know, and that's how on my roster of emerging composers, it's only very short, and sometimes people um, write and they send you examples, and you just have a belief. You just have a belief in them. Um, and so you want to you support, support them and help them. But even so, even on that, even on that emerging roster, uh, on that emerging composer roster, you know, agents, you know, if, if my composers aren't working, I'm not earning. And the, as much as it would be great to be able to champion emerging composers, the onus is still very much on, until you've got credits, the onus is still very much on the composer to, to find as much work as they can for themselves, which they do. There's always, always short films uh, looking for music. Always. 
There's plenty of opportunities, certainly in the UK. There's no reason for a composer not to have a couple of short films ready to be scored. Not necessarily for great money, but the opportunities are there. Hi. I don't know if they talk about this. Okay. <laughs> so um, we're a composer team. We've worked uh, in, as composers uh, since 2005, 2006. We live off it maybe for six or seven years. Our question is, in the past three or four years, um, we've taken part in a lot of pitches, um, very high-level pitches, nice pitches for Disney, you know, for all the title, that kind of circuit that goes around all the agencies. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and our question is, how, um, how obviously, they, they, they never respond. You send them the thing, they send you the briefing, you, you know very well how these work. Do you think they, first of all, already have de de uh, made a decision before they've, um, are they doing like a symbolic kind of thing to make people feel like they can pitch? Or do you think that sometimes we see that they all come from the same agency, like the same four people take you? you yeah, I'm sure you I, 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 I recognize I recognize wholly that 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 scenario. And it's it, it is a mix. I think that there is a need to be seen to do things. So, uh, yeah, sometimes production companies will send out a, a brief because it cannot be seen as a fait accompli that they're going to just work with, a, with the same composer. Um, if you suspect that, you can choose not to pitch and save yourself the time and effort. But you, but you never know. But it's fun. And, and you <laughs> never know. And no music is wasted music. If you're pitching for a project, if they've sent you a script, which is not necessarily working blind, if you've been sent a script, you do conjure up your own images. Learn how to read scripts is, again, is a really important thing to do because it really does conjure up so much imagery. Um, and then you've got pieces of, you've got you've got music to add to your, to your library. So sometimes I think it's a question of doing the rounds and it's already been decided. Um, if you are earning your own living by doing your composing, I think you're in a good place to stand up for yourself. And if people have asked you to pitch and submitted and submitted music, then you are 100% entitled to a response, some feedback, um, and a, a reason as to why they kind of went quiet on you. Because that is waste. That is uh, that's unprofessional, wasting your time. Um, maybe it's easier for an agent to say that uh, than than it is for you. But yeah, I there are elements of that. And how would you explain when sometimes they give you those very specific briefings of, you know, three pages, here are all the characters, you have, we want to talk about this, we want to talk about, and you, they give you yeah. 40 examples, you really yeah. spend a lot of time brainstorming, yeah. you, you boil it down. And then you hear the final product, and it's like burp, 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 yeah, burp, 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 burp. it's really really annoying. And I and I know I'm running late, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna just answer that in a way that it's like, for example, if uh, a, spe a speaker is a woman, so I'm gonna say I'm going out to like a black tie event, and I've got in my head I know what I want I want um, I want like a rock I want a red long satin halter neck dress with some diamonds here and I want a train and I go in my head exactly it might take me a long time to describe it but I know exactly what it is that I want but then when I get to the shop somebody shows me this kind of fuck off blue mini skirt and I'm just going to go yeah plastic and plastic. so that's how that can often work so you get all that and sometimes the longer the brief it means that they you know they they put it in too much thought and they're not open to necessarily the creative are there like teams of people deciding these things yeah or, yeah. yeah okay sorry mm -hmm. sorry i don't think i got there's a question but i think am i out of time for questions yeah sorry but i'm hanging around all day so i can always meet people for coffee or whatever